I wish you most welcome to, to Brussels, for those of you that, that are not from here, and to the European Parliament. It is a wonderful day out there, and I'm happy that I'm in Brussels and not in Sweden, because there it is really, really very gloomy today. So most welcome, and let's, let's hope and let's, let's all contribute to a fruitful afternoon today. I am so happy that you are here with us, and I have the opportunity again to meet some old friends, and some, most of you are to me, new acquaintances that I hope that from, from this day onwards I will be able to call you friends as well. Thank you all also for, for involving me and including me in this important debate. I would like, though, to apologize in advance for maybe not be able to stay till the end of this, of this session, but I want you to know that I stand by you on this case and that you can always come and ask for support or tell me that I didn't live up to your expectations. The reason why we are here today is to debate the demands that European citizens with disabilities have raised, and not only once, but repeatedly throughout the years. Those demands include to liquidate institutions and that no more means from the structural European structural funds, that is, shall be used to renovation or building of new such institutions. This is important to underline. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Article 19, states that persons with disabilities shall be able to choose where to live and with whom they want to live. They shall not be forced to live in special facilities or accommodations. In this case, for once, I am really proud to be Swedish. And since Sweden is the only country in the world where personal assistance is an individual right, it is good to be Swedish. Also, we do not make a difference based on intellectual talent. 40% of the people using personal assistance in Sweden do have intellectual disabilities. In Europe, it is only Sweden and Norway who has, that has liquidated these big institutions for people with, with intellectual disabilities. In Finland, for instance, on which you will hear statements later on this afternoon, I believe, these institutions still exist. But in order to abolish, liquidate, shut down these institutions, there must be alternatives. Often, the only alternative that is offered to people with intellectual disabilities is group homes. That is the best wording I can find. Maybe you can help me to find another one. But as I understand it, it's actually something similar to group, group homes. Is that correct? However, group homes are also a kind of institutions, just a smaller version of them. The liberty to, to uh, conduct your life is not there because the times are fixed and the, the, who you cohabit with is also a given fact and nothing that you can actually prefer or re choose or dis discard. The society has also to be able to offer dif different kinds of support. One solution does not fit all human beings. Personal assistance is for many people with disabilities the only possibility to have a life and to live a life that they control and decide over. Personal assistance is for many people the only way to independent living. The support that is being offered shall be developed in cooperation with the user organization and not be offered as a charity. 
Also, children with disabilities have to receive support that is adapted to the needs of, of this particular child and his or her family. If the society cannot support families, it will become too much for the parents and the family could fall apart. Families must be offered support that allows for the children to grow up together with its own family. If the only alternative is institutions, big institutions or small ones, the parents are left with no other choice than to leave the chi their child in there in order to be able to keep up a working situation and to support the rest of the family. So my pledge today is that we must not let more families fall apart in big institutions. An institution or a group home, no matter how modern it is and no matter how nice the facilities are or how competent the staff members are, it is not a home. Not for children, neither for adults. So, coming to the end of this introduction, I wish you all very fruitful debates this afternoon, and I am looking forward to listen to you to this afternoon and to meet you all soon again. So, thank you very much. And by those words, I would like to open the first session, which is the launch of the MHAE report, Mapping Exclusion, this one, Institutional and Community-Based Services in the Mental, mental Health Field in Europe. And Bob Grove is here to share this first session. I give the floor to you. I know, yes, yes. And um, on our program, Jose Van Remortel, my colleague from Mental Health Europe, uh, is going to say the first few welcoming, welcoming words. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, I, on behalf, I will say, of Mental Health Europe, I'm very happy that we reached this uh, stage of the project. It is a, a long, long standing idea and certainly it grew uh, for many, many months and years before we were able to do something like that. And I, I um, mental health is quite quite proud of the results of it since it is the, uh, the first uh, report that we found uh, and that we have uh, produced based on facts that were uh, given by the, the different countries mapping all the places where people with, and here it is, mental illness, but mental illness and mentally uh, disabilities, uh, the terms are often used uh, together. Mental health Europe, and I, I think it's now the, also the moment to, before uh, you said you would not stay until the end to say already on behalf of Mental Health Europe, thank you to, to Mrs. Wilkinson to uh, host us today and for the interest she, she puts in this uh, uh, subject since it is not, um, let me say, certainly not a, a topic which is uh, in and which is interesting. It's not, a, um, how do you say, um, a, something glossy. It's not a team which is attractive. It's not a team where you can make lots of friends. It's a difficult area of work. And it's also, I would say, brave. Uh, to take up this uh, uh, plea for people who have no voice, who have no say, who have no, in the majority, no rights at all. And I think that that's worthwhile. But Mental Health Europe has also uh, worked a lot on this uh, disinstitutionalization uh, way already for years together with, with ENIL and to work together with a group of uh, ECCL, which was a European coalition, a coalition of some NGOs uh, for community living. And uh, Ines, who is here somewhere also there, uh, she has also done a lot of work on this uh, deinstitutionalization. And we were really looking to the people who were the most institutionalized and had the less chances to get into the community. And uh, I think that uh, this is a, certainly a, 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 big, a, a big 
result that we have today in uh, this uh, report. Um, it was also, I want to say, that uh, Mrs. Mr. Yarab has uh, given us uh, a, a push in the back uh, to uh, work further with this uh, expert group on disinstitutionalization uh, after a conference he organized about the human rights of people living in institutions. And I think that all this impetus have, has resulted now in the, what you see here, and which is now just an instrument to use and to go further, and all of you to correct the things that are in it, since there are here and there difficulties in finding real good figures, since the people are hidden. And it, are, it is a hidden ob a subject in our society. So uh, countries are not giving the good information. Uh, the, the NGOs are not able to work on this. And so it's very difficult. And we count on all of you to uh, give us more, more info, more, and to give us more exact uh, Document. So I keep it by that, wishing, like uh, Mrs. Wilkinson, a fruitful discussion and uh, hope you will all go home uh, continuing this struggle we have, we, have, we have started and we are on the track for the moment. So thank you. And Bob, it's over to you. Thank you, Jose. Um, it's a great pleasure to be part of the launch of what I think is a landmark report. But of course, we have two sessions here today. The first, uh, complementary sessions. The first, the, the, the launch of the report, and the second, uh, using structural funds to support independent living. So it's not only deinstitutionalization, it's what now follows. Okay. And, and I think we all feel, really, this is just the beginning. This is not something where there is any room for complacency. Um, I was reminded of that looking through um, the report um, and thinking that we in the UK closed down our long-stay institutions uh, for people with mental health conditions and, and, and intellectual impairments long ago, um, and most of our children's homes too. And it has taken 40 years for us to find out the scale of the abuse that was going on in those places because we never asked, and the people, when, we to when they told us what was going on, they didn't li we didn't listen. Um, and not only that, but uh, uh, when we, uh, a few months ago, looked, or when a television crew went into one of our shiny new uh, residential units for people with uh, intellectual impairments, we found abuse that was at least as horrific uh, as anything that had gone before in, in the bad old days. Now, this I hope, I fervently hope, is an exception in the UK, but it's something about which we must always be vigilant. Uh, not only that, but just a few weeks ago, we learned that when the, this disgusting place closed, uh, that the people had been sent to more institutions where they still weren't being listened to. Uh, a quite extraordinary situation, uh, and one of which uh, I think we, we, we you know, really are motivated to, to, out of shame, to try and address. The connecting point between these, these things is, is, is the voice of the people who were there was not listened to, not heard, not listened to. When they did speak, then they weren't believed. And, and this is something which is, is ongoing, even in places where we think we've got it right. If we don't listen to what people are telling us about the places where they live and the conditions and the ways in which they are run, and, and we don't find ways of understanding their perspective, then institutions, as, as Celia said, big and small, will be recreated. Yeah. Uh, even where we think we have bright, shiny new places for people to live. So it's, it's a beginning, this. It's very important. It's a landmark document. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce a, a number of speakers uh, responding to this, about 10, ten minutes each. Uh, and our first speaker uh, is, is Emma Toledano from DG Employment, uh, from a unit working on poverty and the integration and, and, and uh, inclusion of the most disadvantaged groups. Um, I understand she is representing her director. So over to you, Emma. Thank you, and, um, thank you uh, for, uh, for allowing the Commission to, uh, the opportunity to, uh, uh, to participate to this, uh, to this event. And indeed, I should also first uh, thank Mental Health Europe for this uh, valuable work, uh, which provides useful policy guidance uh, in terms of mental health and, and deinstitutionalization, uh, providing this mapping 
uh, on the state of play of long-term care for people with mental health problems across Europe. And I imagine how difficult it must have been to extract reliable data and compile uh, such a report. The Commission is uh, in line with our inclusive growth uh, objective within the EU 2020 strategy is obviously, and, and also its call for active aging, uh, is committed to ensuring that, that people with disabilities are given appropriate support to enjoy their full rights and fully participate in the society. A recent research from the uh, EU Fundamental Rights Agency reveals that in many cases, the factors undermining the right to independent living for people with mental disorders are linked to a lack of daily living support, segregated education, inaccessible workplace and services, stigmatization and lack of control over one's own life. That, of course, only further aggravates their social exclusion and mental health. In addition, people with mental health problems and other most vulnerable groups have been most exposed to the consequences of the current crisis in Europe. Key services and policies supporting disabled people have started to be affected by budget cuts and tighter eligibility criteria. So considering these worrying trends, the Commission believes that it is particularly important to mobilize human capital, enabling more people to contribute to the society and the economy and avoid further human capital destruction. This is not only about guaranteeing fundamental rights and well-being, but a fundamental social investment in the future of Europe to ensure prosperity of our society on a longer term and the sustainability of our social protection systems. Therefore, the Commission, in its uh, recently adopted work program 2013, envisages the adoption of a social investment package for growth and cohesion, which represents the Commission response to the social emergency arising from the current crisis. The package is grounded on the idea that by investing in social policies that empower people from an earlier stay age strengthen their capabilities to cope with risk and enhance their opportunities to participate more autonomously in society, we can anticipate and prepare, rather than repair, which is a huge social and economic cost for both the individual and the society as a whole. This argument applies to disabled people, to give them equal chances for health, education and personal development, preventing the need of institutionalization. As you, as you will may see in, the, uh, in more details in the following session concerning the EU funds specifically, in the remit of the new multi-annual financial framework for 2014-2020, which is currently under tough negotiation, the Commission has reiterated the support in, of the European Social Fund for specific actions that aim to help the reintegration of people with disabilities into the society by including investment priorities such as enhancing access to affordable, sustainable and high quality services based on the community, with a particular focus on the integration between healthcare and social services with the aim to prevent institutionalization of the most vulnerable. Also, and in other investment priorities, improving the quality of education and lifelong <laughs> learning with a view to increase participation. In this same framework, the Commission has proposed what we call ex ante conditionality for accessing the EU structural funds. One general ex ante conditionality on disability requires the effective implementation and application of the UN Convention on Rights of the Person with Disabilities. <coughs> there is also a thematic ex ante conditionality for EU member states to have in place a national strategy for poverty reduction that also includes measures for the shift from residential to community-based care. As I was saying, negotiations are tough. They are not going for the moment in the right direction. And of course, we really uh, encourage all the parties that can influence the process to, to let them go in the, in the right direction. Together with the funding, we also, of course, need good policies and effective implementation. The challenge to improve individualized support for persons with disabilities through family and community care and facility their access to mainstream services calls for more coordinated actions between employment, social, health 
education and housing policies. Although most of these policies fall within the, predominantly within the competence of the local, regional or national level, the EU has mobilized a range of instruments for better preventing the need for institutionalization. Let me present some examples. Within its European Disability Strategy 2010-2020, the Commission has committed to supplement national efforts across different policy areas, such as employment, social protection, health education, with the view to overcoming the obstacles limiting participation of people with disabilities in the society. In addition, the, the European Disability Strategy is a key instrument for the European Union to work together with member states towards an effective implementation of the UN Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities, and in particular of Article 9 on independent living. The EU Disability Strategy also envisages the support of policy priorities and projects with appropriate financial resources. EU funds are already supporting actions aiming at preventing the need for institutional care and promoting alternative care for children as well as community-based care services. In this respect, the Commission has supported the valuable work of the European Expert Group on the transition from institutional to community-based care in the preparation of the guidelines for the institutional reforms. And in this remit, we have an important, an important appointment next week. Let me also mention a few additional Commission initiatives in support of disability and mainstreaming disability issues in our work. The Commission recently launched a joint action on mental health and well-being, which is expected to begin in early 2013. I should not go much into detail because I guess that my colleague from DG Sanko will have an opportunity to mention it further on. But the aim of this joint action is to improve the capacity of health system to tackle the challenges related to mental health disorder. And this should lead to innovative partnerships with other sectors, particularly in employment, education and social policy. Also, a social business initiative that was launched last year is a relevant tool for supporting labour market inclusion of people with disabilities, in particular through social enterprises. Social enterprises can provide sustainable employment for people with disabilities and can also act as stepping stones, helping them to find employment in the mainstream economy. The Social Business Initiative aims to support the development of social enterprises, mainly through a regulatory environment, including a European status for certain forms of social enterprises, and also for improving the access to funding for social businesses, including through support from the EU structural funds. The Commission also promotes the testing of innovative and experimental <coughs> solutions for the specific needs for people with disabilities and the dissemination of the most efficient practices. In this respect, the PROGRESS program finances social experimentation projects seen several years in the, in the area of deinstitutionalization. A recent project implemented in Bulgaria, Czech Republic, UK and Serbia aims at improving social participation of children with intellectual disabilities by providing them with the support proportional to their specific needs. Finally, the Commission will continue to monitor progress and trends in poverty and social exclusion through the EU 2020 strategy and the, what we call the European Semester, where we issue country-specific recommendations also in relation to poverty and social inclusion. We have already started preparing for the next European Semester for 2013 and we will soon publish the annual growth survey, which will point out to the policy priorities for the next semester. In this respect, we hope to continue a fruitful cooperation with all the actors committed to the social inclusion of people with disabilities in order to make sure that concrete results are achieved and drawing our attention uh, in terms of monitoring to specifically specific situations that should, uh, give, should get our attention indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. It's, uh, it's good to hear of the collaboration between DG Sanko and DG Employment in these important matters. Uh, we'll save questions till the end, if that's all right, and move on to Agnes Turnpenny, who was a co-author of the report, perhaps one of the main authors, uh, and is going to uh, give us an outline. Agnes, over to you.
Is it switched on now? Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so basically I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the writing of the report and the structure and then highlight um, some of the main findings. Uh, yes. um, the report came from the idea or of the concern of MHE that um, despite various deinstitutionalization initiatives ac across Europe, some people with mental health problems and institutions for people with mental health problems might be left out of the, of the process. So this report aimed to uh, thank you, map long-term care for people with, with mental health problems in, in Europe and also provide up-to-date information about recent reform and deinstitutionalization initiatives in, in the mental health. Um, the, the writing of, of the report was really a, a very collaborative process. Um, the information in, in the report was provided by MHE member organizations over a long period of, tr of time between November um, 2011 and September 2012 this year. Um, MHE prepared a template that we sent to all organizations and received data. And after this, it was a long sort of consultation process, lots of emails back and forth. And um, yeah, hereby I would like to thank everybody who provided data. It was very hard work from, from the organizations and they did an amazing job. Uh, in the end, um, we had country reports from 32 countries that included, apart from the 27 EU member states, um, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Moldova, Serbia, and Israel. Um, the structure of the report, I don't know if you had the chance to look at it. Basically, um, there's a first part which just gives, gives a, a background, sort of introduction of the main human rights legal instruments, um, and includes an analysis of the main findings that we thought came out of the country reports and uh, some recommendations for, for the EU and for member states. And what I think is the main part of the report is, is, can be found in the annex that are the 32 country reports. Um, yes, the country reports focus on five, five main areas. They provide a general overview of, of long-term mental health care and residential care in each country, where we could find data or where organizations could find data. There is also a very brief section on the, on the availability of personal budgets. I'm going to come back to this. Um, there's a section focusing on current mental health or social care reform strategies, uh, a section on involuntary treatment and section on guardianship and legal capacity. And we saw these two, we included these two because they are related to institutionalization at so many levels. We saw that it was important to bring them together in, in one report because very often these are the mechanisms that force people into institutions and keep them there for a long, long time. Um, of course, Due to the nature of, of this, the, the report has some limitations and, and we are aware of these. First, the country reports just provide a snapshot of the situation in the countries and they have a relatively narrow focus on, on long-term care and, and residential care. There are so many other issues in the community and, and short-term acute care that we couldn't really cover in, in this report. And of course, there are some possible errors might remain in the data. We took most information provided by, by, MA, by organizations at face value. Um, so there might be, we might have missed out some important information or in the writing of the report, we might have misunderstood things. If anybody thinks that there is something missing, especially from country reports, please do, do send us information and we will update the country reports. So now I'm going to move on to present some of the main fi findings. Um, one of the findings was that um, psychiatric hospitals are, are still widespread in Europe, across Europe. Most countries have them, not, 
many countries have them. And although most units and most beds are for short-term acute care, there are many people who, who live in these hospitals for, for long periods. In some countries, I don't know if I should give examples here, but in some countries, up 20 or even 40 percent of patients in psychiatric hospitals are hospitalized for five years or, or longer. So this was one of the findings. Um, the other finding is that many people with mental health problems live in, in social care institutions. We found approximately 125,000 people in, in 14 countries, but this is probably an underestimate, and, and the real number might be much higher than this. And um, in some countries, in fact, there are more, more people living in social care institutions than in any other mental health care setting. Social care institutions usually don't provide much therapeutic care, They're just supposed to respond to social needs. Um, um, yes, institutional provision is, is the dominant form of provision in the majority of the countries. You can see here countries in, in red is where institutional provision dominates. And um, in, in a number of countries, um, community-based services, although they, they do exist, they might be quite institutional. There are some countries where <coughs> speak up, sorry. Um, even community-based settings are, are very large group homes. Um, elsewhere, community-based settings only achieve a fraction of, of the people, for example, who, who live in social care institutions. Uh, <clears throat> we also uh, found very limited availability of personal budgets for, men, for people with mental health problems. Um, two countries use this more extensively, the UK and Germany, and there are pilots in, in other countries. And uh, some organizations told us that even though personal budgets exist in their countries, people with mental health problems are excluded from it or, or have, can only access it under less favorable conditions. Uh, um, and we also found evidence of investment in the infrastructure of psychiatric hospitals and social cares, care institutions in a number of countries, very often using um, the structural funds of the, of the EU. Yeah. In terms of um, guardianship, um, the majority of the countries continue to have sub plenary substitute decision-making regimes, which is contrary um, to the UNCRPD. But here are some positive <laughs> developments. Some, uh, some countries are implementing some progressive reforms. Uh, and another thing I, I would like to emphasize here is that we didn't look, we couldn't look at the extent of guardianship that, that, uh, that it's used, but which can be quite alarming in, in some countries, nearly up to 1% of the population can, of the adult population can be under guardianship. So this is, this is, a, this is a major issue. And it's very closely related to involuntary admission and treatment, um, which is what we found is, is increasingly widespread in the community. Many countries are implementing community treatment orders that can subject to people to involuntary, involuntary treatment in, in the community. So this is very concerning. Uh, um, yes, about the recommendations and the conclusions, I'm, I'm not going to go through this because I'm very conscious of the time constraints here. But I, um, these will be translated into a number of languages by, by mid-December. So they will be available if, if anybody wants to, to use them. And uh, yes, so just again, I would like to repeat it. If you have any comments or if you would like, if you think we missed out anything important, please do, do email us. Uh, 
And I think there will be opportunity for questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. It's a very thorough piece of work and it will take a while to digest, but I'm, I know that the people who wrote it really do want responses, so please read it carefully and, and get back to them. Uh, now it's my pleasure to welcome Jan Yarab, uh, who many of you I'm sure know, who is from the UN High Commission on Human Rights. Indeed, he, he's a, a, a leader in, this, in his unit and will talk on, on mental health and human rights. Jan. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you at the occasion of this important event. I'd like to thank the Honorable Member of the European Parliament, Mrs. Wikström, for hosting it. I would also like to thank Mental Health Europe, not just for inviting me, but uh, for uh, presenting this substantive, informative and useful report. Uh, I'm very happy that it shows the difference, you know, that beyond these uh, general phrases that we all need to make more progress, that we actually have several different realities in Europe. Uh, it's nice to have it in those colors on the front page, indeed. Uh, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Regional Office for Europe, has uh, identified the issue of rights of persons with uh, psychosocial disabilities, and more broadly, the issue of rights of persons who are in institutions who are, or who are at risk of being in institutions as one of the regional human rights priorities in Europe. Now, the role of our office, as you probably know, is to promote international standards of human rights law. And in this case, it means, above all, the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We have become also members of the European Expert Group on transition from institutional to community-based care, which is a multi-stakeholder but single-focus coalition of NGOs and intergovernmental organizations which deals with this issue. And this group will be presenting the results of its collective work, the guidelines and toolkit on the institutionalization in an event at the Economic and Social Committee uh, on uh, the 20th of November. Mental Health Europe, of course, is also a member of this group. It's a founding member since the days of uh, Commissioner Spidla, when this was an ad hoc group attached to the uh, Commission. And I wanted to say how much we appreciate the contribution of Mental Health Europe to this agenda, because we think it's really essential that the various strands of the emancipation narratives of various groups of rights holders are really tied together, among whom the people with psychosocial disabilities are among the most stigmatized, most excluded. And we have to recognize that even in the so-called human rights community, even in the UN human rights system, we need to increase the attention given to the rights of persons with psychosocial disabilities. We've been trying to help that. We've launched a process which we call Forgotten Europeans. Some of you were there when we had the opening conference of that cycle in 2010 and a report which mapped the existing international and regional norms related to placement in institutional care, to, treat, to consent to treatment, to rights of residents of formal care settings, and to alternatives to institutionalization. The report is still available. We have another one from this year, though, which I wanted to mention here because it was written by Professor Gerard Quinn, who is one of the key figures, the leaders on disability-related legal issues in Europe, and indeed one of the fathers of the convention itself. And it's called uh, Getting a Life. And this report, shows that not only the member states, but also the European Union, which of course has ratified the CRPD, would be in violation of their obligations under the Convention if they continued investing large financial resources from the EU structural funds into the creation or refurbishment of segregating residential institutions which don't give people their choice that's mentioned in Article 19 of the CRPD. In this context, I would like also to emphasize the importance of the Commission's proposal 
for ex ante conditionalities on discrimination, on disability, the specific one concerning deinstitutionalization in the regulations of the EU structural funds. We believe that without such conditionalities, it's very likely that many member states will continue investing largely in maintaining or enlarging the systems of large and remote and segregating psychiatric hospitals. Particularly those states which are in red on this will, by continuum, be tempted to do so. And this is in a situation when in some of these states, in uh, some of the new member states, as we heard, the alternatives to residential care are what would need to be much more supported because it is either lacking or not, not sufficiently developed. These community-based services is what would need the financial push. And if I may paraphrase the title of a landmark study on the subject published by the European Coalition for Community Living, such a use of these financial resources would represent not only a waste of money, but also a wasted opportunity and contribution to wasting lives, if this was to continue. It would mean that the EU would violate its obligations under the very first international human rights treaty to which it has ever acceded, and it would be left with a burden of weighty responsibility. Because if the structural funds don't become part of the solution, they are likely to become part of the problem. Because further investment in outdated psychiatric institutions will most likely protect them from being replaced by community-based services. Now, we can't anticipate the result of the negotiations between the Commission, the Council and Parliament. We appreciate the support of the Parliament for the Commission's proposal here. But I would like to encourage the Commission to recall that one of the great contributions of the EU structural funds is what they did in the 90s for the reform of mental health care in Greece, when the outside world was alerted to the degrading conditions for persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities on the infamous island of Leros. So we have here Bob Grove, who could tell you much more about that. There are two lessons for me that emerge from that narrative. The first thing is that it, doing the right thing requires leadership. The Commission at that time didn't have the CRPD to, to back it up. There wasn't even the uh, body of non-discrimination legislation, which there is now, but they did show leadership. And the other lesson, of course, is that the narrative, sadly, remains little known to the general public, and it's a, it's a great and important human rights narrative of the late uh, 20th century, and it's a paradox that it remains relatively unknown even within the European Commission itself, although this is one thing where the EU has, through the structural funds, contributed to something very positive, and it should rightly be proud of it. And it's sometimes lost in institutional amnesia because it's no longer on the political agenda. And that's what José André Martel was saying. It's never a subject which is very high on the political agenda in the first place. And also there is the lesson that focuses on the importance of sustained support, particularly in the context of the current crisis and of austerity measures. Because as shown by uh, research done by another member of the European Expert Group, the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities, here in Parliament. Um, services for persons with disabilities appear to be seen by politicians today as soft targets for budget cuts. And Yanis Vardakastanis has also focused on this, the, the president of the European Disability Forum, uh, in many of his statements. This is tragic. This opens the prospect of reinstitutionalization of persons with uh, disabilities who would have been able to live in the community with adequate support. And it's not just in Greece, it is in many countries which are undergoing these uh, austerity policies. In the remaining time, I would like to focus on what the uh, committee of the Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has so far produced in terms of its jurisprudence or 
you could say, quasi-jurisprudence on this issue, as I has been, have been asked to also take on the role of representing the committee. I have to say, uh, we respect the independence of the members of the committee, so I don't represent the committee, and I'm not an insider. I can only look at its work uh, through the published materials, and these are, above all, the concluding observations on the individual states. So let me just quote a few. We know that this is uh, still a work which is in its early stages, that only a handful of states have passed through the review by this committee so far. So the jurisprudence of the committee on these issues is really in its fairly initial stages. But on Spain, on Article 14, the committee has said, the committee takes note of the legal regime allowing for institutionalization of persons with disabilities, including intellectual and psychosocial disabilities, and it is concerned at the reported trend of resorting, resorting to urgent measures of institutionalization, which contain only ex post facto safeguards for the persons concerned. It is also concerned at the reported abuse of persons with disabilities who are institutionalized in residential centers or psychiatric hospitals. The committee recommends that the state party reviews its laws that allow uh, for uh, deprivation of liberty on the basis of disability, including mental, intellectual, or psychosocial disabilities, that it repeal provisions that authorize involuntary internment linked to an apparent or diagnosed disability, and adopt measures to ensure that health services, including mental health services, are based on the informed consent of the person concerned. Now, we all are aware that Spain is one of the countries that came in the more favorable blue part of the spectrum on this map. On Article 19, the committee expressed its concern at the lack of resources and services to guarantee the right to live independently and to be included in the community, particularly in rural areas, and expressed its concerns that the choice of persons with disability is limited by the availability of the necessary services and that those living in residential institutions often have no alternative to institutionalization. On a, in its uh, more recent concluding observations on Hungary, which is a country that emerges in the red color as one that has more people in institutions than in community care, the committee also expressed its concerns about the situation faced by persons under guardianship where the decision of institutional care is made by the guardian instead of the person himself or herself, where guardians are authorized to give consent to mental health care services on behalf of their ward, and regretted that the disability can be the ground for detention. It recommended that the state party review provisions in legislation that allow for the deprivation of liberty on the basis of a disability. And above all, on Article 19, the committee took note that the state party had recognized the necessity for the replacement of large social institutions for persons with disabilities by community-based settings, but noted with concern that Hungary has set a 30-year time frame for its plan for deinstitutionalization. And it expressed concerns that Hungary had dedicated disproportionately large resources, including regional EU funds. I'm underlining this because this is a very important quotation. It's, to my knowledge, the first time when we see a direct reference to the EU and its financial instruments in the jurisprudence of, of a UN committee, uh, that it has dedicated disproportionately large resources, including regional EU funds, to the reconstruction of large institutions, which will lead to continued segregation in comparison to insufficient resources dedicated to setting up of community-based support service networks. The committee expressed also its concern that the state party fails to provide sufficient and adequate support services in local communities that would enable persons with disabilities to live independently outside the residential institution settings. I'm reading this out, and that's the end of the quote, uh, but I'm reading this out because it's a consistent, starting but already consistent jurisprudence of the committee on an issue where you see them nuanced in their approach to a country which 
appears blue and which appears red on, on this map, but nonetheless the vector is the same. And of course it all applies also to the European Union, which had become, for the first time, party to an instrument like this. So when the European Union will be reviewed, it will most likely be reviewed from a similar perspective as the few member states which have been reviewed so far. I think I'll finish here. I had, I had a few words to say perhaps all about the jurisprudence of the, of the European Court of Human Rights, but uh, I don't know if I, if, I, if I still have time for that. I think probably we should move on, and all perhaps right. if you could take some questions on that or make a few comments. Later. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make just one sentence then. I mean, the European Court uh, of Human Rights uh, has also an interesting development in its jurisprudence, which uh, goes from uh, very timid, uh, the, uh, 33 years ago, the Winterverb judgment, which uh, basically uh, only looked uh, at whether a person was, as, to quote, of unsound mind, to the, uh, the Plesho judgment, uh, which is just uh, one month old and which which has shown that although, I mean, it's not entirely where the CRPD is, but it's, it is a really important development of the European uh, cause jurisprudence because there uh, it is a case of a person who was diagnosed with uh, paranoid schizophrenia, but the court decided that that in itself wasn't the reason uh, to, to keep that person, uh, pe keep that person in, involuntary, involuntary, um, hospitalization, institutionalization, and ruled against Hungary because it had not exhausted all the other, uh, all the other uh, uh, possibilities. So looking at these, at these two judgments, and every, all of them which were in between, you can see that even the European uh, Court, which is of course interpreting a much narrower uh, legal text in this sense, the, the European Convention, doesn't really have a very easy entry on this that has made uh, a lot of progress on the same uh, on the same vector as we have been discussing earlier. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jan. That was really meaty stuff. I'm sure there'll be questions. Before we move on to our next speaker, um, our sponsor, Mrs. Wickstrom, would like to say just a few words before. Unfortunately, she has to go. It's very unfortunate, but there are so many things to do this day. I wanted, you mentioned Hungary. I just wanted to give you some uh, a bright piece of news. The other day, two days ago actually, the European Court of Justice ruled against Hungary on criminal, criminalizing the homeless people. You know that this was, this was the case and that's why they were taken to court. And two days ago we have a verdict from the court saying that this is illegal and this piece of legislation must be abolished. And I think it's really a good news. It's fantastic. I have been championing for that in this house for a long time. And finally, justice has prevailed even in Hungary and even with, with, with the homeless people, many of them with disabilities of various kinds. It's very unfortunate that I have to leave you right now, but I hope to seeing you soon again. And I wish you again a very good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, un unfortunately, Jan has to leave also, uh, but uh, thank you so much for your contribution. Um, so we'll let you move on and then uh, pass on to uh, Jürgen Schefflein, who's from DG Sanko, who uh, is, is someone who, who I seem to see rather a lot um, because his job really is very much in the line of the kind of work that we do. So it's a great pleasure once again to see you. Jürgen, and for, for a, 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 a brief response from Didi Sanko before we move on to, to questions and, and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, first, I would like to con congratulate Mental Health Europe and the European Coalition for Community Living for the uh, initiative to uh, uh, invite uh, this report. And secondly, I would like to organize, uh, to, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Wickström um, and, uh, and uh, again Mental Health Europe and the European Coalition for Community Living for inviting DG Sanko uh, to participate uh, in this launch event. Um, 
my colleague, uh, Ms. Toledano Laredo from DG Employment, has already presented to you the broad policy uh, context. So I would like to make just a short statement on the health policy, mental health uh, context. And uh, there, uh, the framework in which uh, this work is happening is the European Pact for Mental Health and Wellbeing. This is an, is an in initiative that has been launched uh, jointly by the Commissioners for Employment uh, and f uh, Social Inclusion and uh, for Health uh, in 2008. And uh, the pact had five priorities, and one of these priorities has been uh, uh, the replacement of institutions by community-based systems and the promotion of the social inclusion um, and the um, combat, combating of stigma um, um, uh, in the field of mental health. And um, we have, in order to build uh, awareness uh, and uh, commitment around these issues, we've organized uh, together with our partners in the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs from Portugal a thematic conference around this in 2010. Uh, and we have achieved uh, that member states themselves, ministers of health, um, have uh, expressed their commitment uh, to uh, social inclusion as the right direction uh, in council conclusions from 2011 under the Hungarian uh, presidency, I have to say, which was very uh, supportive of uh, rising uh, this on the agenda. And one sentence that I would like to quote from the Council conclusions was the invitations to member states themselves, because it's member states who have the uh, key responsibilities the, uh, to act in this field. One invitation was to promote, where possible and relevant, community-based, socially inclusive treatment and care models. And um, this uh, is so a very, a very clear um, self-commitment, but on the other hand, commitments and papers are certainly not uh, sufficient, but must also be um, um, followed up uh, by action. And one initiative to encourage such action uh, in the field of EU health policy was the invitation uh, of a joint action, a cooperation process between member states co-financed uh, by the EU health program and financed to the other half uh, by member states themselves on mental health and well-being. And this uh, joint action will be led by Portugal. Portugal will also lead uh, an, a work package on managing the evolution towards community-based and socially inclusive approaches in mental health. And, uh, but in order to inform um, this uh, work, which is going to start in a few months, in early 2013, we need to have a knowledge base. And uh, for that, we have invited a study, uh, which is uh, being finalized by uh, Dr. Chiara Samele from uh, Nottingham University in the UK on mental health systems in member states. It does have a certain focus on promotion and prevention, uh, but it does also look into social inclusion and the infrastructures uh, in place in member states, numbers of beds, and uh, things that have been discussed uh, or are discussed in this report now. And these country profiles in this study, they have been validated uh, by in, in almost all cases by our colleagues, the governmental, the colleagues in members of the governmental group, group of governmental experts on mental health and well-being. So that's a kind of government uh, endorsed uh, view of the situation in member states. And this report by Mental Health Europe will uh, provide a very, um, will be a, a very valuable complementary uh, um, source of information because it will deliver uh, the situation from the point of view of users and uh, civil society and it will be very interesting to bring these views to compare them first uh, and then to bring them to the attention uh, of governmental experts and uh, last time Mental Health Europe has also participated in the meeting of, of, of that group of governmental experts so there will be a very interesting um, 
um, works uh, with this report uh, both in the joint action and in the policy dialogue with member states. And to have such information is so valuable also because of the context that we have that uh, suddenly uh, many member states are in economic crisis, have less money available, uh, and that, uh, that the reforms of mental health systems uh, have uh, slowed down or come to a halt in several member states. So, um, so and for all these reasons, I congratulate Mental Health Europe uh, and the uh, coalition on the initiative and uh, on the report that we have now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Uh, the, the, we may be to think about having some kind of joint event at mm. the point when For this sure. other report yeah. is launched yeah. so that we can kind of have some more in-depth discussions about the implications mm -hmm. of how they fit together. Mm -hmm. So, something to think about. Right, we have now about uh, 10 minutes for comments and questions. So, we've done very well. Thank you to all our speakers for being so disciplined. Um, if you want to make a comment, ask a question, then could you please switch on your microphone? Could you say who you are? And we'll take two or three at a time, I think, perhaps two, maybe three, and then we'll let our speakers respond. I'm Birgit Görres from Germany. Uh, I, we have the problem in Germany when we uh, build up community-based psychiatric that we don't have any research about our work. The research in Germany is mostly near by the dates of the hospitals and they are paid mostly by the universities and the uh, psychopharmacal industry. And so the common-based uh, psychiatric in Germany don't have any database, and so this um, this shows not the reality. We need your help for the German government, uh, health government, to get money for research, and I want to ask you to help us. Okay, um, let's take questions. Yes, well, I'll bring Emma in, in in a second because she's a speaker and she'll have a chance to respond and to speak. So let's go there and then there, okay? And then we'll we'll have a pause, yeah? Thank you, good afternoon. I'm Simona Geratano from the European Disability Forum. And I would like to ask a question to the representative of the European Commission. Um, in this debate, we've been mentioning the importance of community-based care. So we talk about the institutionalization, which means transition from institutions to community-based care and support. Um, therefore, it's very important that there are available community-based services and services which are of high quality. We were very happy to see it both in the European disability strategy that you mentioned, but also in the communication on the European platform against poverty and social exclusion, that there was an action promoting the development of a common quality framework on community-based services. We didn't hear anything on that. I'm not expecting an answer today, but it would be very important if the Commission would take the time to think who is, if it's going to happen, who is taking the lead on that, and how. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Mulligan from Focus on Romania. Uh, I'm glad to see two representatives of the Commission here, and I would also like to congratulate the, the authors of the report on an excellent piece of work. Uh, we're a lobby group who lobby for human rights in, in Romania, and prior to Romania's accession, we, we lobbied very strongly with the European Commission, and we were told that <clears throat> we should sit down and shut up because membership would solve all those problems. And then when Romania, Romania came into the European Union, we were then told by the Commission that, well, actually, we can't interfere in the workings of a member state. Uh, the, what, uh, there is a disconnect between the Commission and the realities on the ground. In, in Romania, which is where I have the experience, and I was there three weeks ago, there is no intention by government to reform uh, institutional services. No intention whatsoever. At, at, at local political level, an institution is an industry that's important to a village or a town. And th there is no way that they're going to... What they will do is they will divide them up, call them something else in order to draw down European funding, but they will not close them. And the Commission needs to understand that, that you need enforcement. It's not good enough to say to have aspirational you know, intentions of what you're going to do with, with, with structural funding. You need to have enforcement. You need to have some way of compelling governments to act. The Agriculture Commission can compel governments 
on things like the transport of animals, uh, you know, with directives and everything else, why can't the DG Health and DG um, Employment do something about compelling governments to actually do something? Because, to be honest, good and all as this report is, I have a stack of reports this high going back 20 years, from every, everybody from Amnesty to Disability Rights International, and they all say the same thing. They, they identify what the problem is, but the, the Commission, which is the only route to solving this problem, is completely disconnected from the realities on the ground. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can, can I bring Emma in first? There's two um, uh, questions, really. One is about quality framework for community-based services. The other is what do you do when uh, a member state does not respect basic human rights and has uh, a vested interest in maintaining institutional structures? First, maybe to underline, it's been said before that the, the, indeed the European Union is, uh, has ratified the, uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and most member states have already, and the ones left are in the process of doing it. So we are committed to uh, in this direction. Um, in the implementation of the structural funds, the, there is the principle of what we call the shared management. So the Commission is responsible for ensuring that the operational programs that are developed with the member states comply with the EU regulatory framework, which also includes the Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and that the strategy, the national strategies, are in line with the EU framework strategies. The implementation, on the other hand, of the funds lies completely with the member states. But of, of course, we as Commission have duty to monitor uh, the way that the member states implement the funds. And we do monitor this, and it has already uh, happened. Uh, I, can only, I can cite, for instance, a case with Hungary, where we, were, um, we spotted a problem with, in relation to structural funds and deinstitutionalization, and we did write to the, um, to the authority to signal that there was an issue. So um, I think it's very important that a country-based information on, on the situation where EU structural funds um, would, would actually fund something which is not in the direction of deinstitutionalization. I think it's important that this information is brought to us, to our services and to DG Regio, and we are absolutely available for, uh, for discussing and for uh, checking this, this situation we have already, notably with OSI on, on Hungary and on Romania uh, as well. So we do, we do have to check the proper uh, functioning of the uh, management and control system in the member states for the structural funds, and we do have to comply with the treaty and, and, and the convention. Um, we are in, in, in discussion on, on deinstitutionalization, as, as indicated by the previous speaker. We will have this uh, meeting uh, next week uh, on the European um, Group's uh, work on the guide and guidance and the toolkit, and indeed in the uh, framework of the annual convention, we will also uh, tackle that. Um, but I will maybe gather more information for you. Jürgen, did you have any comments? There was a question which I think might have been directed to you on research help for Germany, but maybe you would like to comment on other things too. Um, the, the need for a quality framework has been mentioned, and uh, we do not have an, um, an, an um, obligatory quality framework in place or a formal quality framework, but uh, there, has been, there have been research activities uh, financed from the framework program for research um, and also from the uh, health program on these issues. And one project um, about this has been demobbing. Another one has been the Ithaca study, and both of them looked into quality criteria uh, for long-term health care and, uh, and one of them has developed an, a tool uh, that can be easily used via internet uh, and that we have also uh, presented to our governmental experts where um, settings uh, in hospitals can uh, benchmark their activities and their, their standards, their performance uh, in quality of care um, compared to others. Um, the, 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 the issue that one also, of course, also one has to see that uh, the organization and delivery um, of healthcare and medical services 
um, is under the responsibility of member states themselves. So again, it is offers to member states. Um, and, but it's true that, and, and also they, they need to take up the things that have been developed at EU level. And, and the, the most um, relevant uh, budget for research activities into these issues is certainly the, the, the one uh, of DG Research Framework Programme for research and our horizon 2020 in future. Okay, thank you. Um, just a little word. Uh, the reason that, or the two precipitating factors for getting Greece in the new years of its membership to look at and start to reform its mental health services were firstly the activities of a very small group of very vociferous MP MEPs in the European Parliament, and secondly, the involvement of the mainstream media across Europe. Uh, both you know, the press and television, and uh, uh, that seems to focus minds both in the in the Commission and and elsewhere in in the world. Uh, this is I speak from from personal experience. We've got about two minutes. Has anyone got um, a comment or uh, a burning issue before I hand over to my uh, colleague who who is going to chair the second session? Uh, Pina, could you? Um, maybe you know, I wanted to say something about uh, the research. I don't know if uh, I am. A, can, can if I you go? have a comment, make it now. Yeah, but you've got two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, I think there is another kind of uh, institutionalization. I, I, I am very taken from what the colleague from Germany said. So there is a, the new institutionalization is the, represented by the pharmaceutical companies that uh, do research, do some kind of go, uh, of research. So the very and um, I think we need the ind independent research. Otherwise, the new services it it will happen something uh, in Hungary. You use the structural fund from from bad. Uh, aims uh, and uh, I think the, the pharmaceutical company can make research and validate uh, some institutional uh, basic uh, uh, community based services but very institutional and very medical based so the risk uh, the new institutionalization can be the, this kind of research so we have to be aware of this risk okay do you want I can quickly uh, say to that uh, that it is not um, that uh, for for the reason of um, identifying research needs in this field, DG Research has invited some years ago an, an own quite large scale project which is called Roma, and has uh, the um, objective of developing a roadmap for research into mental health for the EU level. And that is one where a high number of uh, researchers from different work areas have formed a consortium which is independent from uh, industrial influence. And therefore, that's the opportunity to really map uh, the, dif the different needs in promotion, prevention, and treatment care in, in, uh, in medical research. So it's a very complex um, undertaking. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we've started slightly running out of time, but if it's a quick comment, I mean, all right, use that mic. Thank you very much. My name is Andrew Mesha. I'm from DG Regio from the European Commission, and uh, the ERDF was mentioned. That's why I just uh, thought that it's were to say something, uh, you are absolutely right, but you have to know that because of the shared management of the structural funds, I mean, we cannot just um, simply stop actually some, some programs. However, in Hungary, uh, DG Regio actually stopped the, the, the latest call for proposal just because we, we thought that it's not in line with our uh, basic expectation in regards of the ERDF. Uh, right now, the call for proposal in Hungary is much better than before, but still we are not happy with that. And uh, in the next programming period, we are, do, we are trying to, to improve the measures and, and to, to imply some new conditions, as you may know, because of the new structural funds regulations. And before actually implementing the funds, we have to know that the member states, they apply actually the measures which are really ensuring the deinstitutionalization, independent living, and all of the measures which the, use, uh, the UN Convention is um, establishing. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. That's a really useful clarification. So I'm glad we glad, glad you were able to say that. Right. Well, thanks to all our speakers and all our contributors, and especially thank you to the authors of this excellent report. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to my colleague Ines, who is going to chair the second part of our, our event here today. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, so um, I will be chairing uh, the second session of our roundtable today. Uh, just to say uh, for starters, uh, on behalf of the European Network on Independent Living, um, which I uh, represent here today, we are um, happy to. We were happy to co-organize uh, this session today with uh, Mental Health Europe, um, and uh, we are with Mental Health Europe together, both in the European Expert Group on uh, the transition from institutional to community-based care, but also uh, within uh, the European Coalition for Community Living, which the which ENIL, the European Network on Independent Living, is leading. And um, as was uh, mentioned uh, by Mr. Yatap, we um, have put together, oh, it was already uh, Two, two years ago, we have published a report on the misuse of uh, structural funds uh, in the EU, uh, the use of structural funds to renovate uh, institutions for people with disabilities and to build new institutions. Uh, and we are still having this uh, discussion today. Um, we, I have to say some uh, progress has been um, achieved in those two years in the sense that some uh, programs were, were blocked by the European Commission and uh, have been revised. Uh, but we still, uh, what we still see is uh, that, okay, um, some member states recognize maybe that, okay, they cannot uh, invest money into large institutions, but what is still happening is that funding is uh, more often than not going into services which are still not really independent living, living or community living. They are just smaller institutions um, which uh, don't offer people uh, the possibilities to live uh, the life uh, they should have. Um, so um, our next session will be focusing just on de that, on the uh, use of uh, structural funds and misuse of structural funds, as well as on the issue of uh, cost efficiency uh, of uh, community-based services. Um, but um, first, uh, we will start with um, Linda from uh, Finland, uh, who is here with her uh, mm. father Bjorn. Okay. Um, now, uh, we often mention we often mention figures uh, how many people live in institutions uh, in Europe, but. Uh, behind those figures, there are uh, real people, uh, and uh, we are therefore very happy uh, to have Linda uh, with, uh, here with us today to tell her story. Uh, <laughs> um, and we are very grateful to her that she's uh, made the, this trip all the way from, uh, from Finland uh, to uh, Brussels. Uh, so I would hand over uh, to uh, Linda and her father. Thank you. you. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, first of all, I would like to say that uh, she does not speak English. And uh, I would ask you not to ask her in Swedish that does she want to move because uh, she is very bad about uh, timing. So if you ask her about moving, then she say, thinks it's today or tomorrow. So, so um, we can do that in English. <clears throat> So I'm her father and legal trustee, and her, li uh, her life goes like that, that she used to live with her mother in uh, a town called Espo, that is close to Helsinki, the capital. Uh, she tried at that time group home living, uh, beginning of uh, 1990, and. 2000, uh, in a group home close to her mother, but uh, it do, did not turn out very well for several reasons. And then her mother died suddenly. 
and Linda had to move to an institution 170 kilometers west of Helsinki because there was Linda. no other possibilities. Yeah. <coughs> Linda. Now she owns her own apartment in Espo. Yes. Espo. Espo. But she is not given possibility to live there. But she has to live in this institution, group home, 170 kilometers from uh, all uh, her relatives, uh, together with six to eight persons, women and men. And uh, one of the problems in this group living is that uh, it is very, always very restless. There are always persons or clients, as they are called. Uh, and um, if you cannot cooperate with some person, it does not help. You have to live there, stay there, very close, as you certainly know. You have to stand this person every day, every day. moment. Day. And very close. Close. Mm -hmm. uh, also, because some clients only stay for a very short period, because this institution where she now lives uh, is uh, also an um, uh, uh, institution uh, where they bring uh, people for just uh, two weeks or three weeks to get calmed down. So, even if she would uh, meet somebody she would uh, like to establish, establish a relationship with, it's not possible. She has her own room, but all other facilities are joint. She attends a workshop during the days, but evenings she just sits in the group home and uh, usually watch TV. TV, eh? Mm -hmm. uh, so the biggest problems with living in an institution, according to her, are that there are big groups, there are several people living close together, it's restless, noisy, there are problem cases of clients, mm -hmm. there is a lack of sufficient personnel, yeah. no private trips, that means because there is no person only to take her out. So she has no individual life. In other words, it, you. it does not support independent living, on the contrary, because the doors are locked also. And she is far away from parents, relatives and uh, all good friends from her former life. She has applied for personal assistance to stay in her own home, but she has been denied from Espo town social authorities who live in their own outdated world. They do not have the will to help uh, her to an independent life and they interpret the new handicap law wrongly. The officials need very clear and strict rules to fulfill their job. Stop. Job. They also have dealt with Linda's assistant question in such a bad way that it led Linda to make Okay. a complaint to the justice officials a month ago. Okay. Because the institution is situated 170 kilometers west of Helsinki, where I live, it is difficult, time-consuming and very expensive to arrange trips to Espo or to Helsinki for her to meet. It costs 450 euros two ways, uh, to meet me, her aunt, her sister, who actually lives in Sweden, but she visits every now and then, and then good friends from her 
30, uh, for 32 years, earlier years in Espoo town. Um, she must be able to move to Espoo in order to start a new life where she herself can decide about her things. Linda likes to stay in her own Joo. Linda home in Espoo town, but she always needs someone to stay there with her. Mm. That is why she needs help from a personal assistant. We work very close with the Finnish office of JAG, the Swedish association. Jag. Uh, you know JAG is uh, abbreviation, and uh, we do have the Finnish branch uh, established, and Linda is a member of that. Uh, and uh, this association, JAG association, again, works very hard with authorities trying to come to a positive solution for Linda, but so far yeah. without luck. She just received a negative solution from the authorities. Two years of neg negotiations regarding assistant who would enable her to live in her own home. The authorities still want her to move to another group home in Espoo. The Young Association is prepared to take the responsibility for Linda as soon yeah. as the town admits to take the costs. Costs. Yeah. That's her story. And if you want to ask her something, you can ask through me or, or in Swedish if you yeah. can. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Linda oh, oh, oh. and Bjorn. Linda, who got my lady? Do you have a question? Thirty-six. Thirty-six. Six. Thirty-six. Uh -huh. Six. Thirty-six. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much for, for this personal account, I think. Um, and I think we will have time for questions after after the uh, the speakers, so that uh, Six. 36 uh, people will have might Six. have questions. Um, I just wanted to say um, after after your um, uh, after your story, after your account, that I mean, what, what this shows is um, I mean, th there's two things I think. Uh, one is that group the issue of the group homes, which are um, nowadays in many countries sort of a default uh, default alternative to to institutions, uh, so that uh, in the in the in the process of the closure of institutions, the authorities are are building masses of these places uh, in some countries, uh, and often there is the question of numbers, and people say, oh. Uh, well, eight people living in in a group home that is so much better than you know living with two hundred people. But if it's the eight people you don't want to live with, or if it, if there is just one person in there that you don't want to live with, then uh, what kind of uh, life are you going to have? Um, and the other thing uh, which strikes me is how easy it would be for Linda to live independently. Uh, it was just if there was just that little bit of political will because she does have her own apartment. Uh, there is an association, uh, YAG is a user cooperative providing personal assistance. So all that it takes is for the authorities to give that money that they are now giving to a group home uh, to, to move that funding towards her personal assistance and she could have a much better life and be uh, a much happier person. Uh, whereas, unfortunately, this is now uh, not the case. So um, it's, it's quite a striking, I think, account. And uh, I think uh, Linda is not uh, by far the, the only person who is in this uh, situation. I think the other thing uh, that we should take account of, we are here talking about Northern Europe. So uh, it is, uh, we often think that these problems um, are only present in Central and Eastern Europe, but 
Uh, no, in many countries people live in situations and in services where they don't have the, the choice or the control and uh, where they are in fact imprisoned in a way. Um, so uh, thank you very much and uh, I, I hope people will have some questions but as Bjorn said please don't ask Linda any, anything very personal, anything about moving, um, when is she going to uh, move. Um, so um, with that in mind I would uh, hand over to um, Judith uh, Klein, who is the director of the Open Society uh, Mental Health Initiative. Uh, now, uh, Judith will be focusing on um, Central and Eastern Europe, so a bit further uh, to the East and the problems um, there. Uh, so, Judy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I've prepared a, a brief PowerPoint just so you have some of the um, some of the concepts there on the on the screen. You can. Um, we've recently published a report, um, actually at the same time as the uh, the report that Jan uh, Yarab uh, spoke about, called "Getting a Life." Uh, this report uh, is about uh, the European. Union uh, structural funds and the right to community living, um, and um, it it basically sets out a, a legal opinion uh, that we um, that we asked a, a, a British barrister who's an expert in EU law uh, to to help us with because uh, we started thinking about the fact that it's very strange that given the, that the European Union as the supranational body has ratified uh, the UNCRPD, uh, which as has already been said, sets out clearly the right uh, to community living in Article 19, how is it that uh, EU structural funds, which are actually our taxpayer money, uh, how, how is it that that money is being used uh, to perpetuate the segregation and the social exclusion of, of people with disabilities in, in a number of European countries? Uh, and the conclusion that we came to uh, is that that is illegal. Um, so that's, that's what that report sets out, and that report is a available uh, online, so I'd be glad to, to share it with anyone. Um, we have been, uh, as, as the Mental Health Initiative, looking into uh, the misuse of structural funds, uh, which has come to our attention a number of years ago. Um, and uh, we have uh, very clear evidence um, that in Hungary, we've, uh, Hungary has been mentioned a few times already, so um, being from Hungary, I won't beat it up uh, too much more, uh, except, uh, you know, th there's clearly very little political will uh, to actually implement deinstitutionalization in spite of, of uh, the availability of enormous additional resources in the form of structural funds. And, um, you know, this is uh, uh, very nicely evidenced by the Hungarian government's 30-year plan uh, on deinstitutionalization, which is, uh, I mean, way too long um, and, and uh, clearly an indication, I think, that uh, it's always easier to, to stay with the status quo. Um, in Romania, it's estimated that about 29 million euros, which is an enormous amount of uh, money, obviously, uh, was allocated in the form of structural funds between 2007 and 13 uh, for expanding and or renovating uh, 39 existing institutions. Um, in Bulgaria, though, uh, the European Commission uh, worked very hard, I think, to uh, to push the Bulgarian government to do the right thing with structural funds. Uh, and there the deinstitutionalization was focused on children and the priority was children with disabilities, which was fabulous. Um, and, and the commission required uh, that the Bulgarian government come up with a plan uh, that they would need to approve before the money was allocated. Um, and 
somehow things went very wrong in Bulgaria as well, because uh, the default option, uh, as Ines mentioned before, is is building group homes. And and in Bulgaria, the, the excuse for doing that was that we're not a rich country, and because of economies of scale, all we can afford are group homes for, for 14 children each. Um, and obviously, that uh, does not meet with anybody's uh, definition of community living, uh, not to mention that it goes against all of the uh, uh, evidence uh, that is uh, very clear that children belong in families, not in institutions. Uh, uh, Slovakia is another example of uh, where structural funds have been uh, very severely misused um, to the tune of 185 million euros. Uh, to date between 2008 and 2010, um, and that was invested in renovating or building uh, 130 institutions, all of which had over 50 residents. Next, please. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I uh, come to these meetings and uh, most of the time I really feel like I'm preaching to, to the converted um, because we have, uh, uh, again, evidence that there's really broad support uh, for deinstitutionalization, um, certainly at the EU level as well as, of course, uh, uh, on the part of the civil society. Uh, we mentioned these reports, our report, OHCHR's report, the ad hoc expert group, uh, provided a really excellent report uh, to the Commission on the Transition, um, and the newest report, of course, uh, by Mental Health Europe, which I have to clarify had nothing to do uh, with pharmaceutical funding. Uh, we supported the, the report, so, um, so it's clean in that regard. Next, please. Um, Conditionalities in terms of uh, the structural funds regulations for 2014-2020 is a, a big issue, as we know. Our colleague from the Commission uh, mentioned it. Um, of course we all want conditionalities, and of course there should be conditionalities on every member state that wants to spend tens and tens of millions of euros on, on uh, improving, theoretically, the lives of European citizens. Uh, but I have to say that regardless of the conditionalities, because of the, the uh, EU's ratification of the CRPD, which is a legally uh, binding treaty, it's still illegal to use structural funds for the renovation or the building of institutions. Next, please. Um, now is the time, I think, really. Uh, you know, we have a lot of time to, to have these nice debates in the parliament and with our colleagues from the commission, but the people in institutions don't have time. Um, and, um, and now, you know, I, it, it really is a, a, an opportune moment for uh, calling for concrete action uh, that, that something is done about this. And, and that the structural funds really need to be invested in the community-based alternatives. Next, please. Um, we have submitted a petition to the European Parliament uh, through the petitions mechanism, uh, which addresses exactly this issue of, uh, of the misuse of structural funds and the fact that, again, it, it is not legal to do that um, uh, because of the ratification of the CRPD. We were joined by many civil society organizations, uh, both at the national level um, in, in Hungary, Bulgaria, uh, Slovak, um, and Romania, as well as European level organizations, many of which are, are present here. Um, and we're asking the European Parliament uh, to do a number of things. Um, one of them is to ensure that the member states comply um, with uh, their, their international legal obligations uh, with regard to protecting uh, the rights of people with disabilities. Uh, the second concrete thing we're asking for uh, is the approval of EU legislation uh, that includes uh, the conditionalities. So, of course, they, they are important. Um, next, please. And then we're calling on the European Commission and the member states to make the data about the projects available, because it is so incredibly difficult 
uh, to find out actually where did the structural funds go. Uh, we've seen examples of uh, environmental projects to make uh, you know, uh, buildings more efficient and, and green by replacing windows and doing things like that. And it turns out that those were actually renovations of institutions. Uh, but you would never know that um, given the project descriptions. And, um, you know, I think in terms of, of transparency and accountability, which certainly uh, the European Union must be committed to, um, it's very important that, that the actual information about where that money goes is available. Uh, um, to anybody who wants to see it. Um, because again, I think as European taxpayers, we do have the right uh, to know where our money goes. And I think some of us, uh, if not most of us, I would hope, would be terribly offended uh, if we knew uh, that that money was going to perpetuate the, the social exclusion uh, of people with disabilities. And then we're also asking uh, the European Commission uh, to uh, make full use of, of any and all sanctions when, um, when money is misused, um, including suspension or reimbursement of the funds. Uh, the Commission has done that. In Romania, the funds have been suspended. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crime that the Romanian government can't use the funds properly when there is such enormous need. There are so many institutions primarily full of uh, people with intellectual disabilities and people with mental health problems. Um, so that's, that's my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Judy, for pointing out um, these examples of bad practice. Um, and um, also for, uh, for presenting the, this initiative um, uh, the, the petition to the European Parliament, and I think now is um, a really uh, the time uh, where we all have to be alert. Um, also, because the the um, as Miss um, uh, Toledo from the Commission pointed out, negotiations on the new structural funds regulations are still in progress, and um, as she was saying that. Um, you know, it is there is a possibility that some of the the good provisions uh, supporting um, transition from institutional care to community-based services will not uh, go through. Now, now is, the, is a good time also to, to act uh, for us as uh, civil society representatives. Um, so. Uh, let me go to our next speaker, which is uh, my colleague from uh, Enil Kapka uh, Panayotova. She is a board member of um, Enil and also the um, director leader of uh, the Center for Independent Living in uh, Sofia. And she has some uh, very close uh, personal experience of also the, um, the use of structural funds, but also in general um, the progress uh, or the lack of progress progress towards independent living in Bulgaria, so she's going to give us a short account. Thank you very much, Ines. Can I have my presentation, please? <clears throat> Hello, everybody. It's so nice to be here. And I called my presentation with a very complicated to pronounce title, as the complicated uh, as complicated the issue is, reinstitutionalizing deinstitutionalization. Because this is exactly what happens in Bulgaria using huge amounts of EU money. Um, next, please. So I will present to you a small group home case study, which doesn't pretend to be representative at all, but it's all true for more than 150 newly built small group homes. And it reminded to us when we started uh, with the research what um, Viktor Chernomyrdin said many years ago in 1993, we wanted the best, you know the rest. Do you recall this saying? Can I have the next, please? So we, uh, we were doing qualitative research, uh, which was not based just on numbers, but on in-depth interviews with different groups of stakeholders, 
Uh, first of all, we had four young disabled adults from the small group home that we were uh, targeting. By the way, these, um, the, the, the SGH takes 10 young adults with physical disabilities only, but with high level of dependency. Um, who have spent all their lives in institutions, being moved from one place to another. Actually, these were newly born, abandoned children who spent their, uh, all their life in institutions. Uh, so we interviewed four of them, four NGO experts, um, a developer, because this business is really, really lucrative about building SGHs uh, and, and all this stuff. Um, a private company consultant, a social worker, very important um, um, person, a deputy mayor responsible for social policies in the area where the, the, the small group home is located. So as I said, it, we don't pretend to be representative, but it's very much true. Next, please. Now, these are quotations uh, coming from the interviewees. And I'm sorry that it, uh, I can't read it even very well, but what, what, the, what everybody said, or at least those four people, is that um, they don't like the new place, which is the small group home, because they have been moved to the small group home from the large institution. And all, most of them, I would say all of them, eh, the, the, the residents there, they, um, they were not happy uh, by being moved, um, with being moved there. And one of them says, I, um, I, I, was, I couldn't stop crying for over a week. And so, um, they um, they say that even though it's a brand new piece of uh, it's a brand new place with new furniture and everything new, um, they are not happy with the relationships, and they quickly made it clear that it it was not that much relationships between themselves. I mean the residents, but between them and the staff. Even though in many cases, in some cases, not in many, but in, in some cases, it, it wouldn't be really the, the bunch of people who would live together, as Ines, I think, also mentioned at some point. Um, so, um, can I have the next one, please? Um, so, the, the, yeah, and the next one. The staff, on the other hand, uh, has a very contradictory to the residents' opinion, saying that, yes, of course they are complaining, because they used to do nothing, and they used to be taken care of, and now in the small group home, apparently, residents are expected to take care of themselves. But actually, they are not provided with uh, personal assistance there. It's just the staff who has also all sorts of uh, therapeutic uh, professions. Yeah. Next one, please. Um, the, the experts started really uh, being aware that all these small group homes being named in, in all sorts of ways, like family type of accommodation centers, or protected housing, or supported housing, or whatever. They have dozens of names for the same thing. It's actually the same type of, type of accommodation. So it's nothing new except for being smaller and, and, and newer. Our developers seem to be quite happy because um, the, the accounts uh, show that in modest cases of decent developers and contractors, the profit could be between 50, 40 and 50%, which is quite, quite huge. I mean, it's, it's really huge profit. 
But there are cases where the profit ranges between 60, 70, up to 80 percent of the price of the project. So developers are really happy. Next one, please. Well, this is what I wanted the commission uh, people to take special attention uh, because this is the funding going into these new small institutions, both from DG Regio and the other DGs. I'm not that good in names of these DGs. But actually, uh, the, the regional development program which covered the capital costs, actually the costs of building these new places. It was 16 million euro for 85% uh, of that coming from the Georgia and 15 from national budget for what they call 60 projects. And, and 60 projects means 60 the same, 60 times of the same. Um, then the Human Resource Development Program took 25 million, million euros so far, and the Rural Development Program another 9 million. So it's, as you can see, the, this is really huge, huge amounts of money in order to maintain the status quo of segregation, institutionalization, and control over people's lives. Can I have the next one, please? So what we, what we can see is the vested interests in a very clear way where everybody has something to gain except for people who are affected and who are the subject of the care and who basically need support much more than care. And very often, care doesn't mean support. Um, can, so everybody is happy. Contractors make money because they have the projects. Local authorities attract investments, so they are they are happy. These are short-term investments, but still, local authorities operate on short-term mandates. Uh, Former institution staff is happy because they have, they continue to have a job in the small group homes. So actually the staff is all the same. Everything is the same. Service providers are very happy because actually, in, especially in Bulgaria, in most cases, they run the new uh, institutions. National government is very happy because it reports results in deinstitutionalization and high level, high rates of absorption of EU funds. For wrong reasons, remember. Next. So, if everybody is happy except for the disabled people and the children whose voice can't be heard, there is a lot wrong in this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kapka. That was depressing. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a depressing afternoon session. Uh, but um, on, on a more um, positive note now, uh, we will uh, move to um, Cecilia Blank from the YAG Association um, in Sweden, um, which will who will provide us with, uh, with an example of how actually people with uh, all sorts of support needs, very high support needs, 24-hour support needs, uh, do not have to live in uh, group homes or other uh, types of residential or institutional care. They can uh, very uh, well be supported to uh, live in uh, ordinary apartments, um, in uh, ordinary neighborhoods, and actually that makes um, um, and that is not doesn't have to be more expensive than institutional hair, care, care, and uh, makes for very good use of uh, public funding. Uh, so I would hand over to uh, Cecilia. Thank you. I'll try to be optimistic. <laughs> I promise. Uh, the organization YOG uh, is a Swedish non-profit organization. 
the word jag uh, is short for uh, the Swedish words for equality, assistance and inclusion. But of course this short word is very important in itself because in Swedish it means I, not me, not we. And it stands for everyone's right to be the main character in one's life. Next, please. Uh, this is the board of the Jag Association. Uh, I hope you can see that it consists of persons uh, with several large impairments. Uh, you can't see, but uh, it's also in the statutes that to become a member, full membership, you have to have several large impairments of which one is intellectual. Um, today, uh, 600 persons are uh, members of Jag. Uh, they all have large impairments and they live independently in their own homes with personal assistance. Of course, uh, of uh, different numbers of hours, but very many of them need personal assistance all day <coughs> around. And one of these persons on this photo is my brother. Uh, he is 47 years old uh, and is living in his own apartment with personal assistance. And he was one of the pioneers in Sweden who have been fighting all his life for the right to personal assistance. So the question uh, for this point of the program today is why supporting people with disabilities to live uh, independently is more cost efficient than institutionalization. So first of all, when you are talking about money, financial resources, there are always many ways to calculate. Uh, what should you compare with former costs 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Uh, you, can also count, uh, you can also calculate with the uh, people who are working as personal assistants. They are paying income tax, and for the money they get, they pay VAT tax. So there's always many different aspects of talking about cost efficiency. Um, so I will return the, to this. But first, three statements. And this is the first one. Um, it's a question of ambition. Uh, it's not the question about how many persons you are living. That's not the main question. The question is, what do we want to achieve? What do we think is society's obligation for the persons with large needs, large needs of support and services? And of course, putting people in large setting, settings just for surviving will always be cheaper than providing opportunities for an independent life. But maybe it's not that much cheaper that people think sometimes. The second one is no more exclusion. All persons must be included in deinstitutionalization. We hear sometimes that some people, some groups, or some persons with very large impairments, they will need group homes or institutions. And we hear that some children will never be able to grow up in a family. And this is not <coughs> acceptable. You can't leave persons with the largest needs behind when you deinstitutionalize. So no one needs to live in an institution. Every child needs a family. And if the family that they are born in aren't uh, prepared or, or can't be that family for the child to grow up, there are other families. So there is a right for every child to grow up in a family, no matter how <coughs> large impairments they have. And third, service is the issue. To live independently can never mean to live in a special house. The support for living independently must be given wherever the user is. If support only is given in home or in a respite care home or wherever, then it's not a tool to live an independent life. So deinstitutionalization is really not about building houses. And that is a very common misunderstanding. This is about housing. It's not. It's about service. People can live wherever it's accessible. It doesn't matter so much. The members of YOG, 600 persons, they living in their families, of course, many of them are children, but adults get their own apartments or they choose to stay with their family for a while. 
uh, they can find other places, they can live with friends, and they are free to move whenever they want. But also, the support is, when it's not connected to housing, they can travel, they can visit friends, they can go to the cinema, they can attend meetings, go to restaurants, sleep wherever they want. And that is what living independently is about, being a free person. The service follows the user. So, to the figures then. <laughs> um, we made in York, we made some years ago now, uh, five, six years ago, we made a study uh, which is called the Prize of Freedom of Choice, Self-Determination and Integrity. And uh, it is a cost analysis of different forms of support and service to people with extensive functional impairments. Um, to make it understandable, uh, assistance funding in Sweden, it's a legal right for persons uh, who need uh, a large extent of support in their daily life. It's been since 1994. Today, 18,000 persons have the right to assistance funding. And in average, they receive 116 hours support per week. That means that they are all people with large needs, of course. 45% of them, approximately, have an intellectual impairment. And this system is administrated by the social insurance system. It's state-financed. So this is uh, the first example from our study. And uh, it's difficult for some of you, of course, to see now. But it's a comparison between a group home, a specific group home, where we studied the uh, staff schedule and uh, looked into the budget of the group home. How much service do they provide? We knew the cost per person living there. It was 2,401 euro per week. <laughs> you think it's expensive. <laughs> uh, but it was persons, all persons with large needs of service. Uh, and we divided time also into different quality levels, where um, uh, the yellow part is uh, kind of waiting hours where there are staff there but you have to, to um, call to get help. When you don't get help but you can get it if you need it. Uh, and the um, orange part there is time given, uh, actually support given, um, but <coughs> general support given in the group home because sometimes you can't get help there when you need it. You have to wait for your turn. Um, and then we took this amount of money and we just calculated easy how many hours of personal assistance could we provide for the same amount of money. And we found out that we could uh, provide personal support hours, which is direct individual service time, no waiting time. Just when you need the help, you get it. And some other hours, the waiting time, because many of the members of YOG, they don't need a person during nights who is awake. A person can sleep in their home with them or wherever they are, not always in their home, but the person can sleep where they are and be wakened up when needed. And that is the yellow part. And the blue part is daily activity center time that wasn't included in any of these budgets. So we found out that the money is enough to provide personal assistance for a larger amount of hours than it's possible to get in this group home for the same amount. And this is another group home, just to prove that we didn't just look into one of them. <laughs> uh, we actually looked into four group homes. Uh, and this had another cost that was 2,060 euro per week. Uh, and it's almost the same result. And of course, we tried to look into group homes where people lived uh, that could have uh, could uh, receive personal assistance according to the Swedish legislation. People with large needs, because that is a demand in Sweden to, to get personal assistance at all. But we also looked into, uh, we made a comparison uh, for some persons who didn't live in group homes. They had... Uh, um, Another kind of support before the legislation of personal assistance, 
they were living in their families, and we knew that they had a um, patchwork of different services that wasn't coordinated and uh, uh, didn't make them free persons in that way. They had short-time respite care, that is one of the parts to the left, uh, home care services, short-time respite care home, daily activity center, and an employment of a relative. But, of course, this didn't support living independently, because this person had to be in different places at the right time to get the support. And if he had other plans, he got ill or had to stay at home, his parents had to be there and work voluntarily. And that is not an independent life. But the point is, it wasn't cheaper. As you can see, the same amount of hour and probably for the about the same cost, but for a lower quality. So, why supporting people with disabilities to live independently is more cost efficient than institutionalization? This was the question. <coughs> and um, ensuring that the support never is where the user isn't. Of course, it's cost efficient. But it's also a dangerous aspect, we know in Sweden, because it isn't always cheaper. It's, for example, not cheaper than relying on parents helping their adult child for free. And it always depends, as I said in the beginning, on how you calculate. So, and the next. Why supporting people with disabilities to live independently? The main reasons should always be because we believe that all people have the same value. And it is a question of human rights, really. So it's a question of ambition, finally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for this data and uh, also these uh, powerful uh, messages. Uh, now, because we are running slightly uh, over time, uh, I would um, open the uh, discussion. Uh, we have about uh, half an hour. Uh, so uh, please feel free to uh, ask, pose the questions both to uh, the speakers uh, in the, um, this session, uh, but also to um, uh, Bob over here and in general people that we have uh, on the panel. Unfortunately, we've lost all our commission uh, people that were on the panel, uh, but uh, we do have some in the audience and I wouldn't like to put them uh, in the spot here, but uh, if they can answer some uh, question, I'm sure um, they will. Uh, so um, I would um, give the floor to you and again, we can, we can take uh, a couple of questions uh, at a time. I don't, don't want to be hugging this, but uh, just to, to go, go back to something that Judith said, which is that it feels sometimes like preaching to the converted. We've all been at these sessions and at various conferences, and generally we're all agreed on what the end game should be. But how do we translate that ambition into actual action? Because the reality on the ground is that governments, particularly in places like Romania, have no intention of doing any of this. They don't want to do it. The, if you close down institutions, you take away employment in villages, you remove huge opportunity for skimming budgets. If people have independent budgets, it's very transparent, people can see where the money's going. In a large institution, you can skim up to half the money quite easily, and it's being done as we speak. The, the notion that, as, as somebody in government in Romania said to me some weeks back, he used the word imbeciles to talk about people with intellectual disability in the care of the state. When I was talking to him about, about the fact that they're using chemicals to um, manage people rather than giving them therapy or education, they're giving them all a little thimble of, of a liquid sedative every afternoon. Uh, how, how do you cross that mindset? I mean, we can go away from here today feeling happy that we've said what needed to be said, but the people who can make the changes are not listening to us. And, and I, I would say this to Bob or to, to the people who, who are chairing this, how, how do we make the leap from all this aspirational stuff to actual action? Because I'm 20 years working in a voluntary capacity in Romania as a human rights lobbyist, and I see no change in the mindset at all. Thank you.
be would somebody like to uh, respond to that jose and uh, maybe cecilia you want to say something about uh, i mean sweden is very much different from romania but uh, Sweden also started from a place where people lived in institutions. So I don't know if you just want to uh, um, give your thoughts um, on uh, how you, how do you, um, you know, convince uh, the people who need to hear this that uh, this is the way to go and change mindset. So um, I'm glad with your question, but at the same time, I know this situation. Uh, like you, I'm working more than 20 years in a voluntary capacity, also fighting, advocating for human rights and for, um, let's say, building of the institutional care for people with mental health problems, not the, not so much uh, children, and uh, but uh, this is quite... Uh, um, an even more difficult job since uh, with my long-standing experience also starting with children is that when you work with children many many parents are still uh, trying to do the best for their children but once they are grown up parents get older and are fed up with them and they they don't fight any longer or they don't uh, are or not active enough. Uh, the, I think the taboo is so much more for adults than it is for children. Uh, I think that, uh, what do we do? Always knock on the same nails. I think that this is one thing. And the second thing, since the officials are no longer here, uh, is that uh, I hope that out of, and uh, I think I I'm, I'm may say something certainly more f towards Mental Health Europe, that we will uh, try to make uh, the questions which have been put forward here today and which are pregnant, to uh, put them back to the MEPs who have said we are interested to collaborate, we want to do something more, uh, and, and as well Jürgen, as Jan Yarab, as uh, Miss, once again, I followed, but uh, those people who were here, uh, we have to say these were questions. Unfortunately, you weren't there, but we really want to have an answer on this, and we will not leave it uh, without getting at least some impetus to, to, to go further again, that we can, we as NGOs, we can motivate the people again and say, look, at this session we got even a small bit. It all, all those small bits who perhaps can change a little bit. This is my vision of it. So. Bob, you. Yes, I uh, have very little experience from Romania, but in Sweden uh, in the 70s, we had uh, a lot of large institutions. I think we had the highest percentage of the population in institutions uh, in the 60s, 70s. And the reason why it changed, and it changed very quickly, really, uh, but it started in the 70s when parents refused to leave their children in the institutions. The parents who were rebels in many ways, and they started demanding other kinds of services uh, to manage their task, and they refused to leave their children anywhere. And I think that made the politicians aware. It came, so to say, from underneath. Uh, and the parents' organizations were very active. Um, and I think that many organizations were active, but um, maybe it is a, a question of mobilizing people, because I guess that when you are trying to shift power, we are trying to take power from those who have it and give it to those who have no power at all, there will be a resistance. And I think if, if it's not demanded from those who needs to be, to have the power, then it's might be very difficult. So the Swedish example is that the uh, democracy <laughs> made it possible for parents to, to uh, in a political fight, to receive results. Okay, and I think Judy wants to respond, and then Kapka. Yeah, just I, I mean I I uh, 
Having worked in Romania for 17 years, I, I hear you uh, and I agree with you. And, and I think there's not a simple answer, but it's also along the lines uh, very much of what Cecilia said, which is um, uh, supporting examples of the good practice and disseminating those as much as, as possible, uh, ensuring in, in terms of community, real community living that's not institutional, um, supporting the development of the self-advocacy movement, I think, is incredibly important, and ensuring that, that the people themselves have a voice and that those voices are heard, um, not just in the media, but also by, by policy makers. Uh, and again, gathering the evidence um, uh, on on the misuse uh, uh, of funds and and also of uh, abuses in in services, um, leading all the way up to litigation uh, if it's necessary. So I think it's a multifaceted approach that needs to be taken, and and unfortunately, it's you know it takes a lot of time. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add the, because I come from Bulgaria, which uh, as, as well as Romania doesn't have this long history of democracy as Sweden, and democratic culture is something which um, certainly contributes to this process, and we don't have this both in, in Romania and Bulgaria, so therefore it's very important how international communities and the European Union and the European Commission approaches um, all, all the processes which go in Bulgaria and Romania. And, and this is why I think I'm here today and I wanted to be here today and again to say, guys, it's up to you, believe me. It, there are no such powerful forces within our countries as uh, the 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 monitoring and the um, um and, and and the intervention coming from EU. I know it's very difficult. I know that, but this is what can help both Romania and Bulgaria, and and you need to do that. I'm sorry. We uh, we have two more questions. Did you want to respond to the just briefly? Mm -hmm. um, the, the difference between Sweden and countries like Romania is that in, in, in Romania this year, 1,200 children will be abandoned now. So it isn't an issue of the parents saying, we don't want the children going into those institutions. The, the parents are putting those children into institutions. And, and the other thing is that the, the European Commission has not been strong enough. The European Commission has typically, pre-accession and post-accession, has accepted the word of member states as to the situation in those member states, even when it's patently lies uh, the Commission has been quite happy with the paperwork and is not prepared to go beyond that. When Jonathan Scheel was in Romania as a rapporteur, he, he, his final report on Romania's accession was based, in his own words in the report, on things he'd read in the papers in Romania. You know, there was no level of auditing, there was no level of visiting. So, that, but what, what I would like to say finally is that we shouldn't go away from here today thinking we've done the job because we're all in agreement. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions, uh, one, two, three, four, so I would uh, take, I think, all of them and then we get the reaction. So, to uh, Okay. Well, we're talking about the institutionalization and uh, in the Netherlands we see, for example, that community treatment orders, forced outpatient treatments, are on the rise as a kind of response to this deinstitutionalization. And um, of course, we are advocating against it. And then we find ourselves in a world where everything needs to be evidence-based, but we are working on social models which have totally other uh, values. We, we cannot come with physical evidence. We don't think in the way of, of this physical thing has this cost. It's like a totally different thing to deal with. And how can the European Union help us with um, asking, especially for the, for the social evidence and uh, staying away from all the physical uh, so-called solutions like, like quick medicine, quick technology, which are not real solutions. So the next question was here. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I would like uh, uh, speaking with uh, Mr. Mrs. Kap Kafka Pana. Uh, uh, you told uh, it's a very difficult uh, this word desinstitutionalization, a ray desinstitutionalization. I think it's more difficult desinstitutionalize more than the word is the practice very difficult. And I would have told, we're speaking here also of democracy. I think there is a very important parallel and relationship with, the, with democracy. Democracy don't export. Democracy learn day after day, building after building. Also, we cannot export in Bulgaria or in Romania our vision of a disinstitutionalization or our practice, but we can work together for this. For example, I remember what we made with the people in Leros. We would disinstitutionalize people who stay in this island. But I think it takes more and more time because is what learn each people, each people with a contest, with a culture, with a practice. Each people needs to grow in this point. Thank you. Comment? We have a um, question there. Yes. Hello, I'm Nigel Henderson from Scotland. I, I think this has been very interesting, and I think what we have are, are two reports and, and, and uh, presentations that talk a lot about structures and institutions and things. But institutions don't just exist in a physical sense, they also exist culturally. And, and I think that part of the challenge is not just how you change some of the physical buildings, but also how you change the minds and the actions of, of people. And that takes strong leadership, and Bob mentioned Leros and the, the sort of leadership that was exerted there. And I think that's lacking in this situation. And I think we're probably all equally guilty of being a bit complacent because life is maybe okay and so on, and there have been some changes. And I think w what we're seeing is um, an acceptance to so in, in some areas of huge levels of discrimination, stigma, lack of equality, lack of human value. And I, I've done some work in Romania in the past as well, and I think that it's very difficult for people who work in the institutions to accept that the people they have been supporting or caring for for many years might get a better quality of life than they have. And I think part then of the problem is how do we ensure that people get equal value? How do we ensure that the staff, the people who are working in institutions have, are empowered as well and that they're not feeling downtrodden? And already, certainly in my country, we're seeing a huge attack on the wages, the salaries of people who work in care because everything is being driven down. The cost of care is being devalued. And if we don't care about some of the most vulnerable people in our society and we don't reward the people properly who support them, then we won't have equality and we won't make those cultural shifts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob wanted to react, and then I would uh, give the floor to the rest. I would also ask you if you can react uh, on the question of the community treatment orders, maybe, and what do you do uh, if, if there is no maybe hard evidence or economic evidence? I think that was, that was uh, no. or maybe I got it completely wrong. No. Well, I was also suggesting that maybe the European Union could be like explicitly asking for the other type of evidence and not the, the real uh, structural evidence. Mm. I mean, I think on that, um, we in Mental Health Europe have really just started to take on this issue of how we can um, start to, to change the framework in which we see mental illness from the dominant medical model, uh, you know, the, and, and I think the, the collection of evidence will be part of that and I urge you to join with us because this is the kind of issues that I think we're, we're really wanting to get to grips with because obviously behind CTOs, com community treatment orders, there's a, a huge set of assumptions about what is uh, mental illness, what is needed to control people 
um, all of which need challenging. It's 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 very difficult. I mean, we have the same exactly the same issue in in, in the UK that uh, the community treatment orders, which were only going to be exceptions, now become the rule. You know, it's funny how quickly things become institutional uh, within the society, and no one notices. And I guess that's one of the things I wanted to to to, to say. I wanted really to to sort of respond on on. Greece and Leros, but I think it's in some ways very similar to Romania in that there was no real pressure from families to change the system in Greece. Um, indeed, families had been of, of poor people were very relieved when, when their offspring were taken in warships in chains to the island of Leros in the 1950s um, and lost touch with them. And, and likewise, there is no was and is really no user voice in Greece at all. It's starting to it's beginning, but it's starting to it, it, it's only really at, at, at a very undeveloped stage. Uh, what what happened there was that actually people from outside came in, in uh, skilled people came in, 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 in teams from both other parts of Greece but also from Holland and from uh, uh, Italy and worked with the local people to show them different ways of how they could relate to, the re how, how to change the relationships in the institution. Um, uh, and, and this was uh, a very hard process, and it required you know, huge dedication on both parts, both the, the, the residents of Leros, I mean, everyone in Leros worked on or had an economic interest in the, in the institution. Um, and you know, for them to see possibilities required people from outside to help them and work, work alongside them and show them the way. Um, and, and, and that kind of brings me to another bit, really, which is that what happened was that quite a lot of people were shipped off the island um, and I think in some ways they they had the worst deal um, they were moved to places where they were isolated where they were where the relationships they'd had on the island just vanished whereas the people who stayed although the conditions were for the time being quite bad and worse in some cases than the people who'd been moved off it actually they still had their friends there um, and the process of building new relationships was contained within the community and you know, started to be manifest in the tavernas of Leros where uh, former patients and, and staff and, and families of Leros started to actually talk to each other rather than uh, um, you know, be in this great, great divide. I, see, I don't think, I think we, what we do agree on is that we want to end human rights abuses. I think what we don't agree on and what it's perhaps we're still all learners in is what is, as, 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 as Nigel was saying, how to actually reform the relationships that constitute an institution. You know, we, we know it's, it's, it's the easy bit is kind of making the physical conditions better. But I think we are, we are very, very much beginners in some ways in, in, in how to deal with institutional relationships. Just a, a small example in my, in where I live in my, um, uh, in the county in which I live, a, a large institution was closed and um, the people were moved into uh, various forms of group living and then independent living. And now when talked about a few years later, they're starting to tell their stories. You realise that actually their friends, the people that they had relationships with for all those years, they've never seen again. The staff of where, where they've tried to get the staff to contact them, there's no you know, help given, um, and suddenly they, they are there and, and in some cases completely on their own. Loneliness is a terrible problem. Um, and how you can support changes in relationships that make that, uh, you know, uh, an improvement on what was before. I was really struck by some of the comments from your study. And it, it's not surprising that people would be mourning the relationships of the people they'd lived with all their lives. You know, deinstitutionalization is not ripping people apart from their most fundamental relationships. And I think we do need to start talking about these issues in, in, in the round so, with a bit of humility, really, as to how you can, you can move people into more satisfactory relationships with each other and with, with the world, uh, instead of just focusing the whole issue on buildings, physical conditions and that kind of thing. And, and to admit that, really, we're not sometimes very good at that. 
Thank you very much, uh, Bob. Uh, we had another couple of comments or questions. Uh, one uh, from Andor and then Simona. Thank you very much. Um, just really very briefly uh, to come back to some, some questions and remarks. Um, one um, remark which I would like to make is about the conditionality and uh, relation to the political will, because I absolutely agree with you, you did. Uh, we can introduce conditionalities in the future, but if there is no political will and there is no commitment, we can do a lot of things, but it will not happen in the field. And this is the thing what we are uh, actually looking at right now, uh, because um, if you follow the, the negotiations on the new structural funds regulations, that's exactly what's happening. We have introduced the conditionalities. We would like to ask member states to implement it, and member states, they are trying to weaken it. So actually, this is the game what we are playing right now, that how to make a kind of compromise and how to find the best balance between our proposal and what the member states are thinking. And this is actually a partly answering to your question. Uh, I 100% I understand your uh, opinion, but this is not the way how we are working, uh, because we have. To, I know, I see that. This is the, not the way how we are working, because I mean the way how we are working is that the member states they have to say their word and they they will uh, and they have to um, they they have to react on our proposal. Our proposal is to introduce the, institu the institutionalization in the new structural funds period, and member states, as you see, actually in the new uh, structural funds regulations, they have. Uh, at the first glance, they have deleted the UN Convention as a conditionality. So, so this is the game what we are playing. <laughs> and of course, we are absolutely not uh, uh, accepting this proposal from member states. We said, um, and we are still working on that, we are providing actually guidance on the UN Convention for the member states. We will provide some exempted conditionality guidance just to say that we don't agree with the member states' proposal because the UN Convention is still should be applied for the structural funds in the new structural funds period. However, member states, they are not happy with that. So you see, I mean, um, I, I don't say that we cannot do more, but uh, the, 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 the balance should be found and it's not an easy balance. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andor. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm very happy to uh, make my comment exactly at this moment because I have two comments. One is on the ex-ante conditionalities and I'm fully aware of what uh, Ander from the Commission has been saying so far. But um, I don't want to bring, and we know that the CRPD is binding and obliged the EU and the, ratify, the state parties to, compl to um, comply with it. But we don't want to bring the message that the civil society, that the disability movement is ready to accept the deletion of the ex ante conditionalities because in the short term it's way more powerful. It means that the member states will not have the money from the European Commission or they will have to give back the money if they don't fulfill those conditions. So it's very important to have those provisions that were very, very positive, and we appreciate the work of the European Commission in putting them through, that these provisions are defended. And uh, another comment would be on the evidence, and it is indeed very important to have consistent data, and for that we need the European institutions to work on the development of indicators to collect data. And this is also linked to the debate on structural funds, because for instance, if those positive provisions are kept, we could have indicators on how many people were uh, moved out from institutions thanks to EU money, how many people uh, are still entering institutions in several countries. And this is true in this issue, for these issues, but it's also true for many other issues like impact of the crisis on the independent living of persons with disabilities, how this has been affecting them. So in order to really understand the problem, we need the data and we need the indicators. Thank you very much. We have um, in this order uh, a comment from the panel, uh, a question and uh, a reaction. Yes, I wanted to... to uh, say that deinstitutionalization is of course about moving getting um, offering people to move out from institutions but uh, the other part of it as important i guess is making sure that no one moves into an institution mm -hmm. 
And uh, I think that Europe, not only Sweden in the 70s, I think many countries in Europe have a lot of families struggling. Um, maybe um, they are not visible and maybe they are not struggling so loud, but they are struggling and, and trying to manage to not leave their child or their now adult child to an institution. And I want to make clear, I don't think it's family's responsibility to take this fight. Uh, and uh, But they have to be offered alternatives. I don't think it's a cultural difference between uh, in that way that parents in Greece or in Romania are pulling their children away in the first place. I guess it's because they, after many years, find they have no other solution. And that is definitely society's and Europe's uh, responsibility. Thank you. A question there and... Maybe it's, it's a comment. <clears throat> so the, the process of deinstitutionalization, I think, is uh, not only a bureaucratic uh, things. Uh, so I think we, we have now the UN Convention, uh, but it is a very good uh, uh, instrument. But I think it is it is not enough. Uh, or we can control uh, the EU can control if the structural funding. Uh, go in the good direction, but maybe it is not enough, the, the, the control. I think uh, really we need something different. Before we were speaking of new how to build up new relationship, how we had maybe in the 70s or in the 80s when the participation, or, but it was a different world. Now we have uh, a more complicated world. Uh, we have the internet, we have uh, a lot of, and people have uh, a, a more difficult relationship in the direct relationship. Maybe we, we need to, to think to something different. And uh, I participate in Italy to the deinstitutionalization uh, uh, movement, and we, uh, we are going. We went outside the hospital with the users, so we were together. So we could live in the. We could learn how to live outside the hospital together. So we, we, we ourselves as a profession, we had to learn how to live outside and how to have new relationship and. That was very important. There were no books, and there were no theories about that, but we had very simply to learn how to live in a different environment. But it was important that we, the users, the relatives, could live in another. Otherwise, people would prefer to live in the institution if you don't learn. So the institutionalization process need the involvement all of the old community, and I would say all the uh, the old local community. So it is it's a question of local uh, community because it is there that you have to learn to to live in another way. So it, and it is uh, the new evidence. So you don't need much of medical evidence, but you need the, the evidence of new example. And every locality have uh, uh, their own weight to live and to find alternatives. Thank you for these important points. And I would uh, give the word to Jose and to the colleague from the Netherlands. I'll just ask you to keep it quite brief, uh, because we have to. I uh, just want to uh, react a little bit that I am quite pleased that uh, uh, now the um, for the structural funds, and I think that uh, also the expert group who prepared the guidelines uh, is of a big step forward as well in the training of the people. I know that, for instance, for Poland, uh, some years ago, uh, there were there were a, num a big amount of I, I don't remember exactly how much has been given to a hospital in a mental hospital to refurnish a hospital with more than eight. eight 800 beds still. So this is lost money. Uh, and th that is what, what you say and will now, we hope, uh, all uh, people will have this as their Bible and we can uh, give more uh, training. And um, I, I think that uh, if something like uh, giving the, the possibility to uh, when a, a 
question comes from a country uh, when it is in a certain uh, area of work, is it for pe uh, persons with a physical disability or a learning disability to, to, to contact? I think I, I'm asking this, uh, that they could contact the European NGO in this field and say, is this, are these good projects? Since uh, we, uh, as well the EDF, autism, we the mental health, we are working, and, and ENIL, we are working really with, with the organizations in the field. And so we could say, be careful there. We have no say, we have no voice. But I think that this, if you could pass this message somewhere in your department, it would be really helpful uh, that they consult the NGOs, uh, uh, even if it comes to one NGO, to EDF, we are all partners of EDF. So if it's about mentally ill, we, we can come in and another can come in. Okay. Thank you, Jose. I would agree about consultation. Do you want to respond briefly? Uh, and thanks for reminding, because I forgot a very important thing. Um, because we are, uh, the negotiations about the new structural funds has been started already. So actually, member states, they are preparing their documents. Mm -hmm. And there is a very strong expectation from the European Commission to involve the civil society on the national level. And all the, uh, all the guidance what we are giving to the member states uh, is saying that we, you have to involve the civil society and, uh, and let's say the advices and inputs from the civil society should be included in the programming documents. So I really invite you to participate in this discussion because member states, they have to report back to the European Commission about the involvement of society, civil society about the programming. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, the last question. Thank you. Well, um, I think that community treatment orders and forced outpatient uh, treatment are a real threat to deinstitutionalization because it's a public human rights violation when somebody out there on the streets is being attacked and taken by officials. And uh, if this is allowed, and if, even if this is possible by European structural funding, I think this directly is going against uh, deinstitutionalization principles. So I really, really want to ask you if, if um, uh, that, that there can be no excuse to have community treatment orders under the name of deinstitutionalization because it will only make things worse. Thank you, and uh, well, hopefully the 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 um, FRA report on, t on involuntary treatment that came out, I think, earlier this year, um, which, which would um, relate to, to your comment. I mean, uh, since it was uh, commissioned by, by the European Union, hopefully it will be uh, taken seriously. So um, we can only uh, support what you say. Uh, I would, uh, I would uh, close this. Um, discussion now. Thank you very much for um, all the comments um, uh, and uh, thank you very much to uh, all our speakers in uh, both sessions. Um, before uh, we close, I would give um, the word to um, my colleague uh, Peter uh, Lemberg to just give uh, us some um, some final thoughts and then to uh, Maria Neiman, the Director of Mental Health Europe, to uh, really close um, this round table. Thank you, Ines. So, um, I'm uh, Peter from ENIL, um, board member, but also uh, uh, coordinating the Western region of Europe. Um, I've been listening very carefully today and uh, I was asked to, to bring some final comments. Um, I think I see some uh, some subjects coming up uh, uh, several times uh, with diff different speakers. Uh, one one of the subjects is, of course, uh, uh, evidence uh, reports, and uh, I think this uh, new report from Mental Health Europe is uh, again a tool that we can use to to convince uh, people, to convince uh, policymakers to. Uh, to speed up with the process of, uh, can I say, DI? Uh, that's uh, to prevent my uh, falling over these difficult words, the institutionalization. So I think uh, we need this kind of evidence. Um, um, we even even need more and further studies to prove what people are 
experiencing in the field, but people who are often people without a strong voice. Um, and I think the backup of this evidence is, is, is essential, uh, especially on a European level, where I think they want to have an evidence-based policy. Um, so uh, I think it's an important factor. And many, many interesting studies came up here. I'm not going to repeat them all. But in, in fact, we have a lot of evidence already in, in our hands to, to claim further DI. Um, if you hold this against the current situation of uh, economical crisis, which came up several times also, I see the, the gap between the, the commitments and statements, which are uh, very nice, especially on the European level, which is far away from the actual people in the field, actual people who are living in the institutions, who are struggling to have an independent life of their own. Uh, I think this gap is even widening now. Um, the current climbing of cuts, budget cuts, it's uh, often those community-based services and personal assistance uh, possibilities who are targeted first. Um, maybe I can bring up one other study who wasn't mentioned today, which was very, very recently launched, a study by European Foundation Center and uh, done by independent researchers called Assessing the Impact of the Economic Crisis on People with Disability. Uh, if we see what's happening now is that the gap is even widening. So in fact, perhaps we are even going more backwards than forwards. Um, then all this topic of the structural funds, it's, it seems to be an effective tool that the European Union can use to, uh, to get positive change. Um, although if we have the example from Bulgaria, when, when we see that uh, um, in the past uh, there has often been a misuse of uh, this kind of funding, um, maybe it's not such a strong tool at all. Um, and if I hear now that in the renegotiations about the uh, next uh, programming period, um, I wonder what is the weak position there of the uh, Commission to negotiate with the member states. After all, it's the money from the Commission, the taxpayers' money, who is going there. So I would think in these negotiations, the Commission has a, has a quite strong position to, uh, to uh, make his, uh, his conditions for receiving these large budgets. Um, another additional comment, um, we focused a lot on situation in, uh, in, in, in Romania and Bulgaria and, and Eastern Europe. Uh, of course, I think the situation there is uh, it's not comparable with other countries. Um, we've heard about Sweden, where, where there is a legal right on personal assistance. Uh, that's a, a very huge difference between these countries. But I must tell, um, being the coordinator for the Western region, that also in our richer Western European countries, um, we still have a lot of work to do. And still there's, a, a, with the policy makers, uh, not the good uh, mindset yet that uh, they're also in, in, in these Western European countries, there has to be a, a real cultural shift um, from the basis up also. We need to pressurize our policy makers on member states level also to implement real change. Um, and there is a lot of work uh, for self-advocacy, for um, creating this mind change to be done. Um, and this ha has to happen on a local level, on a member state level. Um, and uh, we as a, as a civil society um, uh, have a role to play in that. Um, so. I think uh, this might sum up uh, my personal remarks and also um, some important topics that came up today. Maybe what struck me the most uh, and what will stay with me uh, after this afternoon is what uh, Linda of, from Finland shared with us. Yeah. Hello, Linda. Um, I think this is a very clear uh, example of uh, what what should happen. It's so strange that somebody needs 
and is forced to go live 170 kilometers away um, um, in a situation where they are not happy, in a situation where they are forced to live with other people, which, which is completely in breach with Article 19. Um, that's very clear. Uh, and the solution is quite simple. I'm quite sure that the Finnish government pays quite a lot of money to these group home facilities. It's just a matter of reallocation. It's just a matter of giving the, the, the means in the hands of the people who, who need it and who know best what they can, uh, how, how they can organize their life independently. And if the same budget was shifted from the group home to uh, Linda and the people caring and loving her and surrounding her, I, I am sure that better solutions will, will uh, uh, be very, uh, uh, very in reach. So uh, even in times of crisis, even when it's difficult to find more money, and I think more money is needed on a wide scale throughout Europe, but even if you just reallocate the existing funds, I think we can make very big steps forward. And um, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, forcing our politicians to do that on the European level, but also on member state and local level. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, I would also like on behalf of Mental Health Europe to thank everyone present here today, to, to thank our speakers, of course, and in particular our host, Cecilia Wickstrom. Also, Enel, for the good collaboration in preparing the event. And as this is also the launch of our report, I, of course, also want to thank you very much the, the Open Society Institute for making the realization of it possible. Um, it was, I mean, the publication and the, in the full study uh, was funded by the Open Institute. Uh, but also for any other activities that we undertake, uh, we, we, you already mentioned it's not pharma funded, but for any activity actually we undertake, uh, we do not accept that kind of funding. Um, I hope that the, the publication will be valuable, that you will use it. Um, as it was mentioned in the beginning, it's a tool um, and it needs to be updated regularly. So we are really happy to receive any contributions from your side to make sure that it's, it's accurate, that it's up to date. Uh, we will update the, um, uh, the publication online uh, regularly. We will translate the uh, summary of it into a number of languages um, and they, those will also be available online so soon. Uh, I hope that the, uh, the publication will be another tool also um, to, 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 uh, to move from institutions to community-based services, not to a new kind of institutions, but uh, to, to services that really lead to equality uh, of rights and, and for persons to live in dignity. Um, and this is really just it for me, and we will be pleased now to offer you a drink and some time for networking. Thank you.